Well, perhaps we'll get started. Um, thanks everybody for coming um, to our breakout session about early relational health and how it relates to advancing hope. I'm David Willis. I'm a developmental behavioral pediatrician, uh, now a senior fellow at the Center for the Study of Social Policy. I'm on the HOPE advisory panel um, and um, a part of this process of really advancing the, the health outcomes of positive experiences. And this work um, in terms of early relational health is really trying to fine tune HOPE concepts and framework ever more to the fundamental drivers of building well-being, which are relational and which are in those earliest periods. And so um, we're gonna have a chance for conversation together about how do we adapt um, this, this framing of early relational health within the broader framework of hope. We see that early relational health is a central element of the early childhood elements related to the HOPE framework. So we'll have a ch good chance to dialogue about that, as well as how, what the meaning is of the framing about early relational health within this sense of the HOPE framework, where do you all see the sweet spots and the opportunities. So I will present for probably about a half hour, and then we'll have some breakout sessions for discussion. And then I have a few more slides that we can talk about, another little breakout, and then we, and since we're a nice cozy little group of now about, you know, 13 people, we hopefully have a really good conversation, which I'm really looking forward to as to what all of this work means to you, what it means to how you see the world that you're working in, what brings you to the HOPE network here, and evermore, why are you thinking about this emphasis around the early relational health work? So let me begin um, by saying what I'm hoping we'll talk about today which are, um, what, is, what are we talking about when we speak of early relational health? And within that, listening with thinking about your own mindset, how, are, how do you think about fundamental relationships? How do you think about the criticalness of relationships for building the health of the individual? Then how do you think about your current practices and understanding? Because some of us that have been working in this space for a while, once you move into the dyadic relational framing, it's hard to go back to see just the individual. You find yourself thinking in relational ways and especially in the early childhood space, as we all know, you can't think about a baby without the relationships around them. You really can't think about outcomes of children without thinking about the relational drivers and the context within which relationships live. So I want you to be able to reflect yourself on how this work we're gonna be talking about affects your own mindset. Um, in spaces where sometimes relationships are lost and the individual is the focus, and we have to think about that effort. And then thirdly, can we take these concepts of, into our work as we're all focused on advancing this larger overarching frame of hope um, that we're talking about today? So those of us that have been in the field a while, know and strikingly so how much of baby's future starts so very young and the science is so astounding. The foundations of health, brain development, mind development, stress regulation, social brain development, regulation of affect, regulation of physiological systems gets established. And there's certainly a prenatal experience that happens in terms of the pregnancy health and or its stress and its impact on the physiology. And also, of course, the relational experiences that um, really drive the generational, next generational building of the next generation of people. The development of humanity is through the transfer of experiences um, from one generation to the next. And I would suggest from one person, one interactional space to the next. And then as that young children starts developing their own internal capacities, they draw from the world around them the experiences that matter to part of their developmental processes too. That's a space that has been um, the center of my thinking over my career. Um, being trained in mental health also, I think about mind and brain development as one. 
And um, of course, we measure social emotional well being as an outcome. And if one then starts thinking about what we've been experiencing recently, the, the derailment of healthy growth and development is, is as was even before the COVID, the challenge, but ever more striking. The other part of this work that we're going to talk about is um, as the science of child development has moved forward and Jack and Andy Gardner and others have been so strong at making visible the core story of child development. In all of those framings, we talk about child development is dependent upon the environment and relationships, but we wanted to call that, but I don't think we have fleshed out what is that environment of relationships? What are the details? What are the objective measures? What are the, what are the characteristics? What are the elements? And now we even still talk about the um, mitigating forces of trauma are relational, but what are they? And how do we harness, strengthen, and develop processes that we more fully understand, if not bring as a part of population health and child development and well-being? Um, I continue to be um, shamed that our nation's children are doing so poorly, having been run through federal government um, and thinking a lot about policy levers and then looking again at the well-being, the poor well-being of our children and our nation. I continue to be motivated in terms of what are we going to do about this? It's shameful. And all of our voices need to elevate not only the importance of hope, but also the foundations of building health and well-being, which has to do not only with the um, context around the earliest relationship, but I like to also suggest the relationships and the early relationships themselves are certainly a part of this work. We have to ground ourselves, though, in this moment. And any of you as clinicians know, and then all of us as individuals know about the, the, the shocking evidence as the COVID epidemic has demonstrated the disruption of so many structures and the challenges that, that is created for so many families, especially those who already were at uh, more vulnerability, and that has grown ever to be more so. Not only the loss of income that has been dramatic and um, families really under increasing huge develop levels of stress. Um, and we, we know that children have experienced, experienced numbers of stresses themselves that parents have been reporting that Phil Fisher and his team, University of Oregon, have done ongoing um, surveys of the family experiences of young families under the COVID period. And we know, of course, the children are having stresses and disruptions, as well as growing struggles with the mental health and struggles of families. But you also heard um, um, this morning, um, Bob Segge talking about, likewise, some families have found that there, there's been stronger relational connections and thereby also protective forces. So it's been a, bi a bi-directional process. And in so many sectors, haven't we been hearing about the criticalness that relationships and connections really matter? And it's a really moment of time in our culture where relationship, connections, social networks really matter. And being the eternal optimist I am, you know, we're in this build back better moment of now that the political winds have shifted and it's also an opportunity with the, with this sense of the health outcomes of positive experiences, but also the double entendre of hope. So, and yet, I think it's a challenge to all of us to think, to, to make certain that let's not list, let this time of change go to waste. How can we both be disruptive and leaning forward, progressive, and find new sweet spots of moving our work forward, not only the hope message, but also ever more in the early childhood health and development space, the relational framing. Who would have thought we've come the distance we've come since January with major policy shifts um, that are still coming to be fully understood as to the major elements. Um, if you, one looks at all the impact um, policy shifts by the, the rescue plan, not the least of which is the child tax credit. And the, you hear the languaging and rhetoric about um, the raising the poverty level, um, or reducing the poverty level by 50%. But I also heard some startling numbers just a few days ago 
that yet the poorest and the most severe poverty families don't have are not necessarily connected to the IRS. And they are not automatically receiving their due share of stimulus package monies. And so part of the challenge of the systems work is how do we make certain that families that are eligible for services, especially around the poverty related services, actually have access to that effort. But even still, the effort of change that's happening by the Rescue Act is really pushing forward about opportunities to expand support services and supports in this sense of supporting the relational context. And our friend um, 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 Charlie Bruner and the Ink Marks work has really made ever more visible um, the opportunities of as the American Rescue Act policy dollars flow into states and into health sector about um, public health workforce development, as well as expansion in the community health center and community care work, that's going to be moving forward. The opportunities of harnessing social networks and supports, as well as broadening and new opportunities, that sense of building back better and not letting this crisis go to waste are tremendous opportunities for change. And I'm really both uh, challenged by thinking about that, but also hopeful about how thoughtful people in local communities um, and with these frameworks of hope and, um, and attention to the relational health and social networks of support give us traumatic opportunities. Um, also, just looking at the impacts that are projected as a result of the um, the rescue package and the child tax credit, the reductions are expected to be notable in family poverty levels. Um, and again, if all is realized and families actually get the access to the resources that they need um, in present. So my point of raising all of that is just, we're in an incredible moment of change, an incredible moment of opportunity, and an important way to be thinking relationally and to be champions for not only hope, but also the, one of the building blocks of hope is relationships and connections. And I would surely say about building the next generation of children and to counter the disparities that are deeply start early means that a relational framing is really a unique opportunity in front of us. So uh, let's talk about the relational health concept. One is, we, 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 we define this as a capacity for ongoing engagement, growth fostering, empathic and empowering uh, relationships um, that, and people often ask, okay, so wait, can you tell me more about this? But pictures show so much more. So let's watch for a moment. And I want you to watch the, 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 the interactive space. I want you to watch the relationship first. I assume you can hear it. Uh -oh. <laughs> I'm going to pause it and say in a blink of an eye, you were all in that moment of wonder between them as they shared their experience as a relationship then you can begin to start asking yourself, what are the elements in that relationship that by all of our knowledge and training, you, we would say are meaningful, healthy, and promoting. We'll watch again. So it's self-evident. There's affect, there's serve and return, there's shared eye contact and mutual gaze. There is a turn-taking process and, um, and, and, and an, a, a sheer enjoyment of, of the moment of, in, for each one of them. And it's meaningful for both. That captures what we try to talk about as the early relational aspects. Oh, my baby. And then again, you can go up the developmental ladder to further stages of development and still watch, witness, if not document um, the relational health elements. And beyond um, 
maybe some of you have seen this before, but beyond just enjoying the experience, I want you to also ask yourself, what are the elements that you observe between them that you would say is meaningful to the sense of a positive relational health experience? Okay. Okay. They need to work on that, right? Yes, okay. Did you understand it though? No. No, okay. <laughs> Oh, no, not, not this one. This is, this is the grand finale of this. Oh, this one. Yeah, that's the last one. Now, Jack Shankoff and Serve and Return would be delighted because you're watching this pattern between them. There's affect, there's turn taking, there's gesturing and communication. Each of them is sharing the same mind space, and each is influencing each other in a shared way. That's a relational health. That's what I was wondering. I don't know what they're going to do next season because they did some stuff this time. Exactly what I was thinking. Oh, yeah. And ever more beautifully, they have a shared mind even before the clarity of language. It's all by gesturing. And they're in the same space and one would argue in a clear relational health moment that you can witness that we can see. The science of child development, infant mental health, neurodevelopment, dyadic research, and the like has really been able to document the sequence of, develop, of relational development. It's observable over time. It builds between them. And there are predictable elements that are observable that sequence in those earliest years. And these processes from shared attention and engagement that's affectively driven, that is responsive, that has positive affect within it, that creates a, a shared initiation with each other, as well as shared imitation processes that become more and more complex in then shared gesturing. <laughs> Forgive my doggie, she's saving me from the neighbors. And then um, that shared imitation that are shared moments that become then shared goals and language comes in the interactive space. Language serves a dyadic communication of one mind to the other. This dyadic process is observable, and I would argue the center of pediatric and child development care, and I would argue is the center of so much of the way we think about human development in the earliest period. The science is compelling, um, and there are um, increasing recognitions of the field of dyadic neuroscience, and the whole observation of the synchrony that goes on at every level of the physiological measurements that one can do, everything from one can one can observe in the synchrony at the level of behavior, like we were just witnessing, but also at the level of micro dissection of the way that dance goes on between people, as well as in the coupling of the stress regulation systems, autonomic nervous system regulation efforts, the um, the the entrain, entrainment and uh, synchrony of um, hormonal systems that become aligned by shared positive interactive experiences. And one can actually observe the synchrony of brain wave activity in a secure attached and interactive relationship. At every level, the physiology of building health is embedded in the positive experiences, then in the positive relational patterns. And again, if one follows the science closely, it's shocking, quite frankly how early those elements of development happen and establish the functional systems and structures of foundational health. The other element that is clear that I wanna make visible is it's really bi-directional because there's clear effort evidence too that in the relational experience that women who've had levels of stress have with their young babies, if there are social supports around them, even a woman's mental health and epigenetic shifts of stress can also improve. There's a bi-directional process that can go on in that interactive space that benefits the physiology of both. And I would suggest to you that we talk about how relationships mitigate stress, that that's a bi-directional process. Those of us in pediatrics would say the, often the birth of a baby is a unique opportunity for families to find hope, healing, and recovery. And the more uh, families that have had challenges um, have the social networks and supports of culture, community, and around them 
those healing forces of hope that are built into those relational moments that are bi-directional and often for systems that we often lose. So when we talk about this space, we're talking about advancing a mindset of relational health that has to do with the importance of foundational, these foundational relationships. Um, we have to honor and listen deeply to the family experience of their supports, strengths, and positivities of the relationships and communities around them or not. It is about changing our mindset to realize that um, just as hope provides clarity, if the positive relationships, the environments, the engagement, and the awareness of child development, those, those um, uh, all the strength-based assets are a part of this mindset effort. It's all grounded in deep um, relationships with families that are um, of human dignity and certainly um, um, hopefully bias-free based upon science. And if one begins to absorb this kind of a mindset, it really is, as is the hope, a shift of paradigm. It's a shift of the way we think about the well-being and the development of the next generation of children. We've had the chance through the funding support of Perigee Fund in our work at CSSP to actually look at communication processes and to think deeply with Frameworks Institute, who, by the way, were the partners with the Center for the Developing Child around um, help framing the toxic stress process. They've been in converse, we've been working with them about framing um, this relational health element. And they did some focus group work with us. And this uh, in front of you is a report that they did for us last year. And it's very clear relationships matter. And how you talk about relationships matter. I'll touch on that in a moment. But it was clear that as we were out in the field talking with people, um, early relational health for many is a new term, although within the health sector, it's actually uh, pretty self-evident to understanding that it's a health element. But when you leave all of us in the health sector to talk with parents or to early care and education people and others, early relational health is a new term for them. And we've been very clear that we're not designating a new field and it's not a new series of discoveries. It's really built upon decades of research that are in child development, infant mental health, the fields of neurodevelopment. But it does focus on the centrality of relationships between caregivers and young children, and to bring that ever more evident that it's a driver of health and development. I like to think of it as, you know, where we used to focus deeply on the requirements of immunization to present, prevent childhood illness. This is immunizing and building the relational health capacities for future well being. And the attention has, my belief is, has to shift toward a relational framing to build future well-being, especially now as we're trying to recover from COVID and all the stress that's created for families in our culture, but also because we still don't talk about the fact that we have an epidemic, a mental health epidemic in this country. And built when the COVID hit, the, the increase of suicide rates, the increase of um, that sense of isolation and not and a loss of uh, the vitality of well-being and anxiety and depressive symptomatology that are incredibly high is calling out for how do we start embracing ways to build a preventative mental health strategy that the, that the vision and elements of hope can be realized and that the future well-being that can be well-built by strong social and relational protections can likewise be realized. The other thing we learned from frameworks that was also was rather shocking actually to us, was that when they did focus groups with parents, communities, and early childhood providers, and they talked about early childhood, the first thing they learned is people in this culture age up. They, when they hear early childhood, they think of preschool and above. They don't think about infants and toddlers. The other thing that was found in terms of how we talk about early relationship memory is that, as I mentioned, the health sector understands early relational health speaks to them, us, about, you know, we have physical health, we have developmental health, and now we have a sense of relational health. But to the general public, that doesn't resonate as clearly, but people do understand that there's something foundational about those earliest relationships that are important. The other finding in terms of the framing of talking about this early relational work is that 
it's best thought about as being bi-directional. Both members of the relationship benefit. Now being a grandparent, I know how wonderful it is, the relationships I have with my grandkids, how much they mean to me. And we also know that the parent experience for many has those moments of really meaningful connections with their children. And that bi-directional nature is likewise important to be aware of, as we talked about the early relational health framing, but as it is too, to recognize all interactive patterns are not solely focused on the utilitarian view of building capacity and well-being of children. You know, we're still struggling with that concept of the hurry child, which everything being about, you know, how quickly do children develop to high levels of competitiveness, but sometimes gets lost is there's a joyfulness of the moment for all that needs to be valued. And, and the sense of this relational health framing is trying to capture that. I've schematically just tried to show that, you know, if a mental health has had, you know, has, has a vast knowledge and 50 years of research work that's meaningful, they have developed intensive interventions that are successful, meaningful, yet we wanted to harness the knowledge and bring it into a promotion prevention strategy, not having the stigma of mental health sometimes aligned to this early childhood work. In no way is this a competitive effort. It's actually a, an accelerating effort. I like to say that we're trying to open the door in child health care and practice um, upon which we can um, drive in the army of those that understand infant mental health, but we face right in front of us a workforce shortage. And how do we mobilize ever more um, the child health sector, the home visiting sector, the neighborhoods and communities about the criticalness of, of this kind of thinking in for all families in terms of relational framing. This is an ever more complex um, definition that's been evolving. Uh, you can tell it's a definition built by, you know, by a team. Um, but I just want you to note the elements that are being attended to, that it's foundational, like we said, it's culturally embedded. And we're learning a lot about um, um, the, the depth of knowledge in cultural history and indigenous practices about parenting efforts. We're learning that there are reciprocal interactions that are observable and that all caregivers are involved. So it's not solely mother, baby, father, grandparents, siblings. The relational context around next generation really matters. And we also know that a relational framing actually builds confidence and emotional well-being for all those involved. So it's not just in the sense of the the, the child alone, but all. But think about how that fits in our sense of the hope framework that we're really all attending to. I'd like to say we already have activities that are focused in relationally in, in child health systems that we want to make ever more visible. Certainly, Reach on a Read in this very function has been focused on the relational framing of literacy promotion. As they are now past their 30th birthday, they're really exploring as a network about how they can be ever more attentive to the relational foundations that set up literacy promotion. And the, that work is building in terms of what are the relationship building opportunities that pediatricians can bring with young families about uh, relational dialogues and conversations. And that work is, is emerging. Um, we have the work at um, Mount Sinai with the Keystones of Child Development um, are bringing out materials and training that are focused relationally. As we move into team-based care, certainly Healthy Steps and Project Dulce, which have a specialist in the medical home whose job is to partner with families, and more importantly, focusing relationally to the needs of families, is a natural growing platform of opportunity to advance our relational health framing. Um, everyone is asking, okay, so now, well, wait a minute, how do you measure this? And I can talk with you a little further about that, but there's work going on. But let me be clear, if we're going to move, or as we're moving into the relational health space and thoughts about measurement, what immediately arises is, is equity and the fears of judgment, the fears of, uh, can I trust you? The fears of, um, I have to have a trusted, safe space and relationship 
with my provider such that I feel as though we're a team rather than you're going to tell me how to do it right or wrong. It gets into some very interesting equity-based issues that we're, of course, all exploring. Um, also, in the community, recognizing early relational health promotion and the good work of hope doesn't happen solely in that little attachment pattern of um, a mother baby. It, the context matters deeply and supports around communities that strengthen families and connections to communities really matter. And these other support structures in communities far under um, resourced and under not scaled, though, are relational health interventions, not the least of which is the home visiting space. And um, that is an actually a direct relational health intervention in homes. Yet, even some of that work is top down telling families how to parent as opposed to supporting the relational growth. And the field of home visiting is in that dance right now of trying to explore what is actually their role in supporting the relationship versus telling how the relationship. And those are very different processes. And in home visiting, for example, um, only about 40% of families offered the opportunity for home visit actually accept it. And when, inquire, when one tries to get deeper into why that is, there's often um, equity barriers and distrust of the systems. And so we've got a distance to go in terms of partnering with families over time. But the, the, we also have communities that are starting to talk about all in initiatives around a relational framing. Um, one of my favorites is Janice Grinnell's work in, in the Bridgeport um, Baby Bundle which is a, um, a, a cross-sector, formal, informal system of addressing the needs of the earliest relational patterns in a sense of all babies, all in, all supported. When we talk about, about the observations of relational health, there's some amazing science coming down the pike of being able to rather quickly observe the, the emotional connection and some of the fundamentals of how that's built by um, the orienting response that's visible in the interactive space between a parent and a baby. These are observable characteristics. They're actually sentinel signs of relational health. Our dear friend, Colleen Kraft, about eight years ago said, relationships are a vital sign in pediatrics. And from that view, what are the elements of the vital sign? And we watched those videos before that showed affect, showed turn-taking, showed serve and return, showed um, shared experience, show, showed engagement and reciprocity. There are additional elements that can be observed, if not um, promoted, that have to do with the fundamentals of orientation responses, engagement, and autonomic system connection um, that we're just starting to learn about in terms of the relational health space. People are thinking about, more importantly, how do we bring relational health promotion into our efforts? Um, a team in, in Michigan with Kate Rosenblum are actually using video feedback within the medical home with families. Families are offered before their well child visit by the co-located uh, mental health provider in, in six um, FQHCs. Families are called beforehand offering to make a movie and to talk about their parenting experience. 78% of families come. They want to do this before a, a well child visit and a 15 minute video and then, a, and then turning the, the, the iPad around so families can see and a discussion about what did the family witness, a relational focus. When there are a little bit of struggles, families actually will reveal that they would like a little more support so it allows for them the beginning of the intervention process. There's some work that went, that's going on in DC um, with a healthy steps model. Um, and what was discovered was that it was in, in with the African-American community um, within the health system, the depth with which trauma and race, the race and social justice issues are so much a part of the experience related to health 
that they, the Healthy Steps providers discovered that simply having conversations about families' um, relationships and what they mean to them and their histories opened the door for further um, promotion and awareness about a relational frame. A couple more thoughts. There's a lot of work. I mentioned the work with Reach on a Read, and Reach on a Read touches um, about 40% um, of child welfare children in this country. It touches every state has a has a an affiliate, and about a third of um, pediatricians are a part of that network. That network is really looking to advance the relational health frame. And just for fun, um, in our pediatric offices, in those moments of reach out and read encounters, they have the opportunity to witness the relational space. And they're in active dialogues about how can they develop the promotion efforts, as well as some observational tools, as well as ways to know in sense of once the relationship's strong, and one doesn't need more guidance. That work is, we think, a unique opportunity to, Go move, for it. to move forward. So um, I would argue it's all about the relationship. And within the Reach on a Read experience, families have, have their own experiences. And then there are experiences that we see in the exam room. There are a lot of similarities. But remember that in the medical home, that's a environment that may, may or may not always be conducive to the observation or discussion of the relational patterns themselves. And that work is being discussed and um, will help and guide us. So I've been droning on for about a half hour, and I'm sure all of you are reflecting on your own thoughts about all of this. And we thought it would be valuable at this moment to. Um, Maybe first, if there's any few questions that you would like to ask, but then I want to create some breakout groups where you could reflect on this question. What does it mean to you in your work? How do you think about it? Where's your mind shift? What, what, what draws you in or what makes you anxious or what makes you think about how this work is meaningful to um, where you are presently? Rather than go into small groups, because um, um, I'm going to move us forward, we can still do a group. A, a small group effort, but let's bring this further to relational health and hope. And let's think together about how these framings work together. And uh, I'll give you my, some of my, our take that Bob and I and others have been focused on. We think that the early relational health element advances hope foundationally and from the early childhood space. And the, the, the building blocks of relationships with safe and strong environments, not only in context around the family and context around the relationship matters. And of course, that sense of being connected to a community because a mother or a mother in isolation with a baby, that's an emergency from my view, from many of our view, because who helps take care of the, of the caregiving relationship itself the embedded nature of relational supports are really important for the well-being of a young family, as well as for the well-being of a young child. And all of that is a part of the emotional relationship growth that happens as a result of these efforts. That's, we would argue, embedded in the relational health space. Um, I don't need to go further because Bob's really made clear the science is compelling around all of this. Bob was talking and others about we're really moving far beyond ACEs to resiliency and building health and open capacities. And Bob's talk about the importance of those positive, those positive um, um, childhood experiences. Those are all, so many are relational and contextual. And ever further, how do we mitigate the impacts of stress and also help create the healing processes from previous histories of trauma, racism, adversity, used through a relational promotion lens to build well-being. The more we focus on those positive elements of supporting relationships for next generation work is right in front of us. The other part, place to pay close attention to about our work of hope and also the work that's gone, that's 
carried forth from Jack's work about the um, toxic stress movement is of course the deep recognition of how adversity impacts the physiology early. Epigenetics, uh, long-term health and development, what's not yet built out is the mitigating forces of relationships that bidirectionally impacts epigenetic impacts by strong relational supportive environments. There's a lot of healing that happens relationally too. That research is not yet as visible and we believe needs likewise to be called out um, ever more strongly. But to do relational health work means it has to also happen in communities where people live. And place-based work we think is where the action is in advancing a relational health frame. So it's not one sector, it's not the child health sector or the home visiting sector or the parent education sector or one, you know, or the child welfare sector or the like. It really is a collectivity of working in, we call it an all-in strategy in place-based communities with multiple actors coming together, believing for the next cohort of babies and families, um, surrounding you know, social supports networks, that work of hope, as well as the foundational relationship um, as an all-in strategy is where the place we believe um, the work builds. And of course it builds on that sense of hope, but it gets ever more targeted to a strategy in the prenatal to three space. So that um, one example is the work in Bridgeport. There are clearly other communities that are place-based and focused upstream. Certainly the Promised Neighborhood agendas, certainly the Pritzker now, prenatal to three agendas. Um, and so many communities recognize that these all-in upstream strategies of not only um, the basics of connecting with families like universal home visiting and family connect effort and um, the healthcare system and its role in, in both identifying needs and creating resources and supports and connections, but also the informal systems that surround families that are in neighborhoods by informal um, individual neighborhood leaders or church communities or other informal systems surrounding next generation families with social networks and support matter. Of course, investments care in terms of um, the knowledge of child development and the importance of, of um, resiliency and healing and narrative of what's your story and, um, and we'll find a way of hope and possibility. But tell me what's happened to you in your past. How do we, um, you know, how do we partner with you so that your past does not become destiny for the future of your children and families? That's a neighborhood supported structure and effort that's really important in a sense of activating community, then trying to harness data out of that. But really the social network and, and, and cross sector awareness that building relational supports, promoting foundational relationship networks of support and, gui and guidance when necessary is part of the work. And recently, um, the Charlie Bruner and the, the Inkmark work has really been calling out now the opportunity in front of us about building out those, those um, relational health network people, the sense of a workforce that goes everywhere from doulas to community navigators to community health workers to home visitors to those care coordinators between the medical home and the community. Um, all of that is part of building out an infrastructure of relational health support in communities. And again, as the Biden-Harris uh, recovery plan moves forward and there are dollars, infrastructure dollars coming to communities, how do we champion, we need dollars in the prenatal to three space for the building a workforce for the next generation. That relational health workforce effort is a part of the kind of thing. The last two comments I wanna raise has to do with None of this work of relational health can happen without listening deeply to the lived experience of families. And more importantly, have, partnering with families in a way to listen to what all of us in the service sector can do to help bring what matters to them. And to be deeply mindful of the um, 
traditional dominant culture, um, uh, white supremacist, white fragility, um, uh, dominant culture, um, uh, racist efforts that make for so many families a distrust of us trying to help them. And that only breaks, I think, by individual relationships and conversations. And more importantly, all of us in the service sector having spending a lot of time reflecting, listening, learning on our own journey of having been built in a racist structure ourselves. How do we learn to listen in a new way and value the, 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 the strengths of all families and all communities as a part then of a relational frame in front of us? So there's a lot that really needs to happen in that space, all of which we've been touching on around this hope framework. Thank you for your time with us and you know, go forth and carry the message. Um, we try to, you know, the relational framing matters. We all know it, not all do. And remembering that it starts really early. My own wish is that, um, that we be thinking about the relational experience of every new, new family with every new baby born and thinking about in communities, how do you surround communities with the next, you know, the, all the new babies that are born this next year? How do we work together? Right to Ron's idea, how do you expand into a place-based community and all-in strategy for our next generation of babies in our, in our neighborhood or in our community, in our county? Organizing ourselves around place-based initiatives with multiple actors together with a relational framing of social networking and support like Ron was talking about. I think that's where our future lies. And that's all about hope upstream about a relational framing within the hope frame. So thanks for your time. I think we get a little break. Have fun at your next session. Reach out at any time with me. You know where I'm at, CSSB. And uh, be well all. Thanks.